From the Annie E. Casey Foundation, I'm Lisa Hamilton, and this is CaseyCast. At the Casey Foundation, we work to build a brighter future for children, families, and communities. The challenges and critical importance of advancing this mission is something that today's guest knows very well. A respected clinician and public sector leader, Patrick McCarthy joined the foundation in 1994 to manage a five-year, $20 million effort to provide high-quality, community-based mental health services to children in high-poverty communities. Fortunately for us, Patrick's career at Casey extended far beyond that five-year mark. He went on to hold positions of increasing responsibility, all devoted to improving human services practices and policies to boost results for kids and families. Then in 2010, Patrick was named the foundation's president and CEO, a role that he has used to realize, among other things, a fairer and safer juvenile justice system and a more family-focused child welfare system. After 25 years at the foundation and nine years at its helm, Patrick has announced his intent to retire at the end of 2018, and I have the honor of following in his footsteps and serving as Casey's next president and CEO. It's an exciting period of change for both of us and for the foundation. And for just a little bit longer, I can say this, so I will. Welcome, Patrick. (laughs) Thank you, Lisa. (laughs) And uh, let me just start by saying how excited I am to have you stepping into the role of president and CEO. It it makes it uh, much easier for me to step away from a place that I love. Well, thank you so much. I am delighted to be able to follow in your uh, amazing footsteps and appreciate the opportunity I've had to work with you for so long. So we get an opportunity to talk about uh, about what's going on with kids and families, what's happened over your time at the foundation, and uh, a bit about your leadership there. So why don't we start by talking about the nation's kids and families. You arrived at the foundation about 25 years ago. How have things changed for kids since then? Well, on a lot of measures, kids are doing better than they were 25 years ago. Uh, teen pregnancy is way down. Mm. Substance abuse uh, appears to be down for the most part. Um, Less juvenile crime than we had 25 years ago. Graduation rates from high school are better. College enrollment is higher. Health coverage is better. So on some measures, uh, kids are doing better than they were 25 years ago, and that's encouraging. Kids are making better choices than they did. Right. On the other hand, there's considerably more economic volatility, Mm -hmm. and families are less financially secure than they were 25 years ago, which has a huge impact on children. We've seen that the importance of education, and especially post-secondary education and skill gathering, uh, as well as early work experience, is more important than it ever was. Mm. And so uh, we are also seeing, unfortunately, a higher rate of what we, we call disconnection. That is, young people in their teens and 20s who are neither in school nor in the workforce as the requirements for joining the workforce have, uh, have gone up. And then the other changes that I think we're all familiar with, especially those of us who have kids, uh, 25 years ago, the Internet was hardly a thing. <laughs> right. um, uh, smartphones didn't exist. Mm-hmm. Uh, social media didn't exist. Right. And these are huge changes in the landscape for all of us, and they've had impact, I think, on on, on children as well. Mm. So what do you think um, uh, we still need to do as a country in order to make um, more progress uh, for kids? What what more do you think we need to be focused on? You know, what do you find frustrating that that's happening for kids these days? So it's it's a mixed picture, right? On the positive side, uh, again, I mentioned the uh, upswing on some of these measures. Uh, we are seeing in some areas of government, not all areas, but we've seen in some areas of government, especially at the state level, much more interest in trying to use what works to help kids and families' lives be better, mm. uh, more use of evidence, more use of data. Mm-hmm. Uh, 25 years ago, there was a strong sense that nothing worked uh, mm. in juvenile justice and to a certain extent in child welfare, that mm. it, Families were, um, if they were in trouble, there wasn't much you could do to turn things around. And with careful research and lots of um, uh, dissemination of successful programs, we now know much more than we did 25 years ago about what it takes to support families. So I think that's on the positive side. Um, I think the 
persistent problem that we have seen at best uneven progress is the divides in our country, the mm -hmm. multiple divides. Mm -hmm. I think the bedrock, sort of the fault line of those divides run through issues of race mm -hmm. and ethnicity. Uh, and the tendency, I think in many countries, but we in this country seem to um, have difficulty getting past a tendency to uh, try to identify people who are different in some way, who we believe are different, uh, or who we may have disagreement with, uh, or we may be, um, because of stories we tell uh -huh. ourselves, we convince ourselves we should be afraid. Mm -hmm. Uh, to demonize, to, you know, the term other, mm -hmm. <laughs> make them the other, uh, and somehow hold them up as the cause of um, our problems, even though our problems have many, many different kinds of causes. Mm -hmm. um, so that deep vein of uh, racial hatred in some cases, distrust in other cases, and just lack of understanding, mm -hmm. that permeates not only in our day-to-day -day discourse or day-to-day -day lives and individual experiences of racism, which are, of course, so incredibly painful, but we've allowed it to seep into how we think about policy, how we think about what we as a country, what we as a community ought to be able to do so that everybody has a fair opportunity and everybody has a chance. Those uh, stories we tell ourselves about race and the stories we tell ourselves about people who are different from us mean that people are less likely to support what are really some common sense solutions mm -hmm. that we otherwise could take. And I find that immensely frustrating and incredibly uh, uh, painful. Could I ask if you sure, have yeah. thoughts about what might help us get beyond that as a country? One is we, uh, even those of us who may consider ourselves progressive, We've tended to define issues of race around, um, you know, what what the folks who are actually the victims of the racism ought to be doing differently. Mm -hmm. um, even those of us who I think have good intentions and try to think proactively, there's been a tendency to um, uh, sort of make it uh, an African American problem or a Latino problem mm -hmm. or a Native American problem or an Asian American problem. And at its core, racism is a white problem. Hmm. There's just no question if you look at history with an objective eye <laughs> uh -huh. uh, that uh, the roots of racism and how it has played out are deeply a white problem. Hmm. And so one thought is that those of us who are identified as white um, really have a different kind of obligation mm -hmm. um, if we believe in racial equity and we really believe deeply in inclusion. Mm -hmm. It's really up to us to speak out in a different kind of way and maybe help uh, others of us who are white start to examine some of the assumptions. So that's mm -hmm. that's one thought. I, I see that happening a bit more, okay. a, and uh, it's my deep hope that as that hopefully spreads and becomes more commonly understood as the responsibility of, of folks who want to see change, that um, we will also work harder to ensure that groups that have been marginalized or othered or whatever, that representatives of those groups have an opportunity to not only just come to the table, but to set the table, mm -hmm. be the head of the table, set the, the, court, the, the, the terms of dialogue. And those of us who are white and have held lots of positions of power and influence for generation after generation will be smart enough to take a step back and listen. So that's like one strain of thought. <laughs> right. the, the other is, you know, I have four adult kids and I you know, listen to how they speak and um, who they hang out with and mm -hmm. their friends, et cetera. And I have to say that I have a lot of hope mm -hmm. for the uh, generations coming up from behind us. Mm -hmm. uh, it's clear that this is a country that's on its way uh, to being a majority minority country that is that white folks will be in the minority um, you know by 2050 I think the workforce by 2030 that's right around the corner right. and my hope is that that will also help to change things I think some of the turmoil we go through right we're going through right now the rise of more explicit expressions of racial hatred and violence um, uh, is 
perhaps a sign of people recognizing that things are changing. Mm -hmm. So in the, some of our worst days, I try to tell myself, yes, but this is a horrible thing that's happened that is a symptom of the fact that things are changing and they will continue to change, uh, hopefully for, for the better. But uh, you know, I don't want to be overly glib about that. Yeah. This is, this is deep. <laughs> this is deep and, it, and it's work. Yeah. Exactly. Yeah. Yeah. Um, that gives me an opportunity to, to ask you about a, um, a leadership role you played in Baltimore following the Freddie Gray incident. Mm -hmm. um, uh, I saw you step up and become a leader in mm -hmm. Baltimore at an extraordinarily important time in the city's history um, after a very painful racial incident. Could you talk a bit about um, what you thought your responsibility was following that incident and, and how you tried to help the foundation play a leadership role in the city at that time? So um, I think it's fair to say that the foundation from the time we first moved to Baltimore in 1994 um, has attempted to play a positive role in Baltimore. And obviously, we're a national foundation. Um, most of our work is in other cities and other places. Mm -hmm. um, but from the early days, there was careful thought about how uh, a foundation with our assets and with staff that live in Baltimore, what role we should play. Mm -hmm. um, I think we did okay. I think we did mm -hmm. well. Uh, we certainly invested heavily in certain areas of the cities and certain, certain projects. But I think we never, um, until the death of Freddie Gray, I don't think we ever reached as deeply uh, into Baltimore City as a whole mm. and in neighborhoods behind, beyond East Baltimore where uh, the East Baltimore Development Institute is. So other than EBDI, we did not have, uh, not only did we not have deep, we didn't really have relationships. Mm. Um, with a lot of groups from West Baltimore. And certainly for a foundation that focuses on kids and families and young people, we didn't have um, close relationships, ongoing relationships with young people uh, mm -hmm. in, in Baltimore. So um, this really came from Casey staff, to be clear. I mean, I asked the question, but they came with the answer, mm -hmm. folks who live in Baltimore, and said, you know, the foundation isn't understood or known in many neighborhoods across Baltimore, and the foundation doesn't understand mm. many neighborhoods across Baltimore. Mm. And I think that was a real missing piece of our work. Um, and so uh, as uh, staff, again, uh, who live in Baltimore, pressed for us to think differently about how we do our work, uh, we began to engage young people in a different way. Mm -hmm. Uh, and hopefully become more accessible uh, mm -hmm. as an organization. Now, I should quickly say for, you know, 20 some years, we had been providing, you know, um, grants to organizations throughout Baltimore. It isn't that we weren't doing anything, but I don't think we were as attentive to um, the importance of a deeper understanding of the day-to-day -day lives mm -hmm. of young people in Baltimore and what they say that we need. I think um, as I prepare to walk out the door and as you prepare to take the role, I think we've got a lot to do ahead of us, mm -hmm. um, not only in Baltimore, but in Atlanta and other places, uh, to continue to build those relationships and to be affected by folks. Well, I think one of the things that you lifted up during that time, there was a lot of focus on uh, the police and about community police relationships, but you, I think, helped redefine what the issue was and really refocus the city around young people. Could you say more about sure. why you thought engaging young people was so important? Because I thought you helped the city really recognize there were a group of young people who really felt left out and yeah. our, our real work needed to be on helping them connect to opportunities in the city. Yeah, um, understandably, most of the attention was on the, um, the last 24 hours of Freddie Gray's life. Mm -hmm. And, um, uh, of course, a lot of attention on the last few years of police community relationships. Mm -hmm. But Freddie Gray was 25 years old. Mm -hmm. And, um, you know, the, the challenges he faced didn't start a couple years before mm -hmm. his final interaction with police. And they didn't start with his own birth 25 years ago. They didn't start 25 years before <laughs> that. So I think our perspective was if you really look at the 
history of Baltimore as well as many other cities, but the history of Baltimore and what it took to get us to the place where so many young people in East Baltimore and in West Baltimore had lost any sense of hope, any sense of connection to opportunity, um, any sense that Baltimore was a place where they could be successful. You know, unless we understood that trajectory, then it was difficult to imagine that we'd be able to be helpful in setting a different trajectory, right? right? Mm-hmm. So um, that really was, I think, our take uh, as we thought about what's Casey's long-term investment. You know, we, we uh, commissioned a study where there was lots of conversations with young people, and the one quote from the report that came out from a young person said, um, you know, Baltimore is a set-up city. Right. You know, we're set up to fail. Uh, the whole system is stacked against us. Mm-hmm. And that term, that set up city, you know, just ought not be like that, right? Right, right. And so the work of uh, organizations like Baltimore's Promise, which is, you mm-hmm. know, looks at from prenatal actually, but all the way through school and then connection to work and to success, that notion of let's think about a cradle to career uh, system of, of supporting young people is where, um, you know, our, 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 thinking, our thinking went. Yeah. We've talked a bit about, you know, how young people have been doing over the last 25 years. Why don't we talk a little bit about uh, Casey uh, and what the foundation was like when you got here 25 years ago and how you think our work has evolved? <laughs> so um, it's interesting. Um, the foundation had been headquartered in Greenwich, Connecticut, before moving to Baltimore. And I joined along with a cohort of folks who were hired around the same time uh, when the foundation moved here. And uh, I was uh, among the cohort that took the total number of staff to 50. (laughs) (laughs) And we're now 200. But um, uh, the folks who had been here before that uh, that move uh, couldn't believe that you know, there were 50 people now working at Casey, and I still remember uh, I re- attended a, uh, a staff retreat. It was actually before I, my first day in the office. And Doug announced, Doug Nelson, my predecessor, uh, the CEO at the time, announced with great excitement and fanfare that uh, in the next year, the Casey Foundation would pass a billion dollars in assets, mm. and now we're close to $3 billion. Yeah. Uh, So it was, of course, a smaller place uh, back then. I think in terms of the work, um, what I find interesting is um, in the earliest days of Doug Nelson's presidency, uh, when, which was a time when the foundation was, its endowment was starting to grow Mm -hmm. um, quickly, we launched something called New Futures. And New Futures focused on young people, on Mm -hmm. adolescents. And essentially uh, had this notion that you could convene a collaborative and that collaborative from different parts of the city, these various cities we're going to work with, the education sector and you know, child welfare and juvenile justice, but also business and um, uh, government and churches, et cetera, could come together and sort of figure out how to help young people do better. Mm-hmm. And so... Uh, uh, that was an initiative that had some success, but was generally considered not to have been very successful mm-hmm. overall. There mm-hmm. was lots of lessons learned, you know, which is foundation talk, where it didn't work the way you hoped it would, but, <laughs> but at, you least you won't, yeah, at least you won't do it the same way again, right. so you, you learn something. But by the time I got to the foundation in 94, the foundation strategy had evolved into um, these multi-million dollar, multi-site, um, multi-year uh, initiatives that were what we called entry point initiatives. Mm -hmm. What that meant was rather than trying to change an entire system all at once, Mm -hmm. to go in and say, so what's the thing that if you change that, it might make other things change? Mm -hmm. So in juvenile justice, it was detention. We could have focused on probation. We could have focused on incarceration, Mm -hmm. could have focused on different kinds of alternatives, could have focused on the courts, et cetera. The decision was made to focus on that period of time after a young person is picked up and accused of something but Mm -hmm. has not yet had a hearing Mm -hmm. and, in many instances, is held in locked detention. So that was an entry point. Mm -hmm. Uh, In child welfare, it was foster care was the entry Mm -hmm. point. In uh, reproductive health, it was focused on already active 
uh, sexually active adolescents mm. um, in, in Plain Talk. So we launched from 92, roughly, roughly 1992 to roughly 1995, over that three-year period, we launched like six or seven of these wow. huge, huge in a sense of, you know, each was, was in four or five cities. Mm -hmm. Each individual site got anywhere from a half million to a million dollars mm. per year mm -hmm. uh, for that period of time. And it was meant to last five years. Right. And this was at the time in the foundation world, like very, very unusual. So that's um, some of the things that were going on. Uh, the other thing is that in my first, uh, within my first couple of weeks, um, the first meeting of something that was called uh, a staff formed committee called um, Race, uh, Culture, and Power, I believe, mm -hmm. RCP. I think it was Race, Culture, and Power, which subsequently became Respect. Uh -huh. And Respect is the staff driven uh, uh, organization within the foundation that helps to push the foundation to pay attention to issues around race and ethnicity, um, uh, sexual preference gender identity, a whole list of issues. Um, so uh, I still remember that very first <laughs> meeting, how excited people were and how many people showed up. <laughs> like virtually everybody showed up for the, the first several meetings of, mm. uh, of that group. So that was going on. And over time, how do you think the foundation's work has evolved? You've obviously um, been quite a catalyst in helping us focus more on issues of racial equity, but other ways that you think the foundation has changed in its approach. Um, I don't know how much policy work we were doing back in uh, the early days and if you uh, have seen that evolution um, over time, but how have you seen our, our work change? I think it's changed, changed a lot. I mean, first, you know, I joked about lessons learned is what you say when yeah, you know, initiative doesn't work out the way you thought it should. But actually, I think we did learn a lot from those early initiatives. Um, we launched a huge initiative, Making Connections, mm -hmm. um, which, um, you know, from which we learned a lot. About Even taking on neighborhood work, which wasn't exactly. a part of our initial. That's right. That's um, right. Yeah, we had efforts. we had launched Rebuilding Communities, which was sort of like the other initiatives, but it was in five places, mm -hmm. and um, it was just kind of in its first or second year when I joined the foundation. Um, but based on rebuilding communities and some of the systems work, the notion of making connections was how do we bring everything we know together mm -hmm. in uh, some places. We started with 22, <laughs> 22 <laughs> cities. It's a lot of places. It's a lot of places. <laughs> uh, and then over time, uh, you know, it, it winnowed down to about seven. But um, that was when I think we got much more uh, sophisticated about partnering mm. um, because part of the whole Making Connections work was to identify uh, national organizations that would support the themes of Making Connections, mm -hmm. places like uh, United Way and Big right. Brothers, Big Sisters, et cetera, as well as policy advocacy groups like, mm. um, uh, rather policy uh, membership groups mm -hmm. like National Governance That's Association, it. National mm -hmm. Conference of State Legislators. Um, but. At the same time, uh, Mike Laracy, who mm -hmm. recently retired, but Mike Laracy began to build a network of uh, inside the Beltway policy think tanks and advocacy groups and centers. And we began, through Mike, some very strategic grant making um, and build up that kind of um, network of organizations that could not only carry Casey messages, but also could inform Casey's thinking about what we ought to be doing and had a lot of success in uh, a number of really critical areas like earned income tax credit, for, for example, and budget policy, et cetera. We had a network of Kids Count grantees, one in every state, but they were primarily just doing the data work and uh -huh. producing data. Uh, and it was my thought when I first came into this role that we were missing a way of thinking about them as our kind of retail outlets mm -hmm. of KC ideas, as well as missing the opportunity to learn from them about what was going mm -hmm. on at the state level, which is part of why I hired you <laughs> <Thanks>. <laughs> to come in <laughs> and help us think about how do you make that sort of vague general thought into mm -hmm. something real. And that's the wonderful work that you and your team did uh, to strengthen that network and to support them in doing their policy work mm -hmm. and their advocacy work and their communications work. Uh, and so between that and the state priority partnerships, which is another network of state level folks, um, you know, you build a very strong network uh, across the entire country and in every state of uh, analysts and thinkers and communicators and policy advocates on behalf on behalf of kids. 
And at the same time, uh, over time, we ramped up our work with places like the National Governors right. Association, National Conference of State Legislators, all those civic partners, uh, all the groups that Mike had been working uh, with. Mm -hmm. By kind of pulling them all together under your leadership, I think we got much more sophisticated about how we do that. Thank you. We had, um, I think we did well with our communication strategy uh, in the early years. We had some really terrific people working uh, on it, um, but we didn't have a very strong and robust team we, just in terms of numbers, in mm -hmm. terms of sophistication, and again, under your leadership our communications work um, got much, much more sophisticated, and we got much more strategic about using the Kids Count brand, for example, using the Casey brand, putting out more policy briefs, more data briefs, uh, which I think enabled us to um, up our credibility and reputation um, so that as we got more and more in today's age of social media, um, uh, we've sort of you know, the old saying about punching above your weight, but we've we've actually had uh, more impact than one would expect just with the resources that we that we have. So I think that's been a, a really exciting thing to uh, to watch. The before we get off of sort of changes at Casey, I would like for you to talk about the sort of intersection of the issues that Casey works on. Mm -hmm. um, some folks may not know why we do child welfare plus juvenile justice plus economic opportunity plus yeah. community change. This is always a tough balance. So you don't want to be doing so many things that you're not really doing much in any one Money. area. So that's the tension on the one side is, mm -hmm. you know, how do you find focus and how do you find uh, the niche that you can contribute to? On the other hand, given the um, expertise we have on staff and especially among our networks of grantees and, and others, Given the credibility that we've built up as folks who understand you know, kids and families and, you know, Kids Count, which looks at all aspects of child well-being, um, there are lots of opportunities for Casey to make a difference in different parts of a family or a child's life, mm -hmm. right? So whether it's health uh, or whether it's of a family struggling in, in uh, child welfare or, or economic opportunity, uh, we do have something to say. And so sort of balancing those tensions uh, is is a critical part, I think, of the CEO's uh, job to uh, keep it alive. I, When I first came in, um, I was concerned that we were uh, considerably siloed and there was a way that when you went down the different things that Casey was doing, it sounded more like a menu of very different dishes rather than kind <laughs> a of meal. a meal, like <laughs> one meal. Uh -huh. uh, and so uh, it's when I actually form, first started with what I thought was something people could easily remember, the three Ps right? of permanency, <laughs> poverty, and place. Uh -huh. Um, as a way of saying these are the things that unite us and then over time recognize that that was very much inside Casey <laughs> and may not um, may not communicate to the outside world, again, with the help of folks like you. Mm -hmm. And uh, that's when we started to talk about family opportunity and community mm -hmm. and framing it as what does a child need to be successful? Right. If our mission is brighter future for all kids and families, what do all kids and families need? They need a strong family. They need opportunity, and they need to live in a community that supports their family. So right. um, that helped to be able to tell a narrative both internally and externally that I think uh, knit the work together in a, in a better way. Right. And I think the Im importance of focusing on those families that are most at risk um, also, I think, has become uh, a defining uh, character of Casey that um, we really are focused on those families who are most likely to run into trouble, who are most often in crisis. And by focusing in those three areas, it enables us to pull together the kinds of supports that are going to help those families thrive I think, ultimately. I think that's right. And that's part of, again, balancing that tension of trying to do everything right. versus, um, you know, uh, focusing. We end up focusing by identifying the population that we are going to try to contribute to. Mm -hmm. And it's not that we don't care about other populations, mm -hmm. but we can't do everything. Right. And so what's the population we're most concerned about exactly, as you said, mm -hmm. those families that are uh, low income and living in communities that have uh, concentrated poverty and whose kids are most at risk of not having the opportunity that we all went for for all of our kids. Mm -hmm. 
Well, I, I'd love to pivot our conversation to leadership. Uh, mm-hmm. As your successor, I am deeply interested in uh, in your thoughts about um, what you think uh, have been your greatest contributions uh, to the foundation's success and your advice to me uh, as you uh, move towards retirement. So first, let me ask you, you know, as you look back on your time as president and CEO of the foundation, what are the things you're most proud of? In terms of the long range, what I hope will be a long range um, uh, impact over time. Um, first is uh, helping the foundation focus more intentionally and more explicitly on issues of race, on issues of equity, on issues of inclusion. To be really clear, the foundation has always been uh, attentive to issues of race uh, under Doug's leadership, certainly. Uh, I mean, almost all the work that we do in the foundation from the time that I've been there uh, disproportionately contributes to the success of uh, young people of color, families of color, in part because they are so often the ones who are, for example, um, uh, involved in the juvenile justice Mm -hmm. system and disproportionately incarcerated uh, or whose children are removed, et cetera. Mm -hmm. So uh, it's not that we were starting from scratch by any means. Um, But... I do think um, we needed to look much more intentionally at our role in promoting equity and inclusion. And uh, thanks to uh, the work led primarily by Nanette Sykes, who just you know deserves almost all the credit here, she and, and her team uh, and the folks who supported her, as well as staff at the foundation who came to me many times and uh, frankly pushed me in a good way to say, you know, we're not doing enough here and Mm -hmm. and we need to hear your voice, et cetera. So thanks to all of their work, um, I think uh, we opened up opportunities for how the foundation could be more intentional, both internally Mm -hmm. in our own processes, you know, to walk our own talk, Mm -hmm. um, as well as externally to begin to put out... um, tools and encouragement and examples um, and expectations Mm -hmm. uh, for ourselves and our partners uh, that uh, I think, uh, I certainly hope, will be an enduring um, legacy of the foundation Mm -hmm. uh, as as the foundation moves moves on. To have been here throughout that, it has been a profound shift in the way that we do our work. And as you know, I had the great pleasure of working with Nanette uh, Mm -hmm. on on this work. And uh, I certainly think that is Um, among the most important contributions. Your leadership and your voice, not just inside Casey, but in the field, I think have been catalytic to help lots of folks think about how to do this work differently. I certainly certainly hope so. And, you know, it's been a lot of lessons learned. (laughs) 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 Lessons learned that uh, for me, um, you know, a real, and it's a continuing evolution of thinking about about this difficult work. Uh, the second thing that I hope will continue to be a focus at Casey, but something that I feel good about in terms of what has already been accomplished, is uh, frankly putting a stake in the ground around youth prisons. Right. Uh, these adult type institutions where we uh, lock young people, um, often for not very good reason, mm-hmm. to begin with, a lot of young people locked up who don't need to be locked up. Um, but in conditions that we would never want for our own child. Right. Uh, and so, you know, I talk about the My Child test. It, they just totally fail the My <laughs> Child test on every measure. Mm-hmm. And uh, it feels like something that a foundation like Casey ought to do to be clear to the field. Uh, these are unconscionably failing institutions. I call them factories of failure. And uh, yes, we don't have all the answers of how to replace them and what to replace them with. Um, But, you know, it's it's as if you had an assembly line of kids going by and somebody with a hammer hitting kids Mm. in the head. And somebody said, well, we can't stop the assembly line Mm. until we figure out what else to do. Mm. I'm sorry that we are doing the equivalent uh, in terms of the trauma that young people are experiencing. And the fact that they come out more likely to continue to do harm to others, mm-hmm. 
less likely to be successful in life. Nobody wants that. Right. You know, I've talked to victims of crime. They don't. They don't want kids to come out and be right. more likely to hurt people. They right. want they want to see these kids turn their lives around. So that I think um, has been uh, an important piece of of what um, what I've what I've tried to do. I mentioned you know building out this network of advocates. Uh-huh. Um, I think that'll be a long you know we'll continue to pay dividends. Mm-hmm. Uh, I'm sure under under your leadership. I mean I think you you rightly note that so much of what uh, supports children and family needs happen at what they need happens at the state level. That's and right. so um, your intentional focus on making sure that we've got the right sort of um, support structures and advocacy at the state level to make that happen, I think, is reaps dividends for millions yep. and millions of yeah. families. And, you know, I think perhaps um, most importantly, I feel that the the senior team and the committee of managers and all the staff, I think over, over the last eight or nine years, I think we've all worked to try to strengthen the organization internally, to mm-hmm. strengthen our own capacity, uh, to get our um, finances in shape, to position ourselves to continue to make a difference for a long time. And, um, you know, frankly, I think uh, one of the things I feel best about is um, leaving the institution to you. Oh, thank you. <laughs> thank I do. I know. Um, I don't think there's a more important job for a CEO uh, than making sure that you're always aware that you're not the last CEO. <laughs> uh-huh. And that if you're smart, you find folks inside who have the potential to take up leadership as they grow and develop. And that by the time you're ready to step down, they're ready to step in and take the place to a whole nother level. Well, and, thank you. Yeah. That's a quintessential UPS philosophy. <laughs> <laughs> Having spent much of my professional career there, um, it is an organization keenly focused on uh, leaving an institution yeah. in uh, in good hands. And yeah. so uh, thank you for allowing me to be a part of Casey's oh, legacy. Of yes. It is. A, so yeah. you, you, uh, you leave me big shoes to fill. That means uh, my last leadership question is about uh, what advice you would give me? What uh, what would you tell me you've learned and, and what would you want me to think about as I take up this role? Um, so again, these are thoughts, not answers. You'll <laughs> find your own of those, of course. Um, I guess first, um, you know, I followed behind Doug Nelson, who was CEO for 20 years, and in my view was one of the best foundation president CEOs that this country has ever seen. Mm -hmm. I have just deep, deep uh, respect and admiration for Doug. Uh, So it was pretty intimidating to imagine stepping into his shoes um, or even having anybody expect me to step (laughs) into his shoes. And uh, it it took me a bit to um, recognize that uh, I didn't need to be Doug Nelson um, or a Doug Nelson kind of leader. He was a different Mm -hmm kind of leader than uh, I would ever be, um, but that I ought to be the Patrick McCarthy kind of leader. So mm-hmm. one ad- piece of advice is be the Lisa Hamilton <laughs> leader. <laughs> um, uh, obviously listen to lots of folks who have advice, but uh-huh. you know, you know, uh, if you bring your strengths uh, and are, are aware of your own weaknesses and so balance them out with people around you, mm-hmm. Um, you'll be much better than if you somehow or another have an idea in your head about how you should be, mm. you know. And that's that's that was a lesson that took a little bit of time to um, for me to kind of settle in. Related to that, um, just constant development of your team. This is another UPS thing, but um, I think it's a Casey thing as well. Constant development of the senior leadership team, of the committee of managers, of the senior associates, of staff at every level. That mm-hmm. that recognizing that the more energy you put into developing them and giving them opportunities to do things that um, uh, will expand their their strengths, uh, just so multiplies your leadership mm-hmm. leverage um, because they uh, they're they're so uh, critical. Uh, to that. Um, And then I guess the last thought is, uh, again, took me a while. I don't think it will take you as long. I think you're already there, but it took me a while uh, to recognize the opportunity that the position grants to 
um, in some ways lend your voice or to use that position, use those opportunities to bring attention to folks who don't have the opportunity to, um, you know, they, they don't have the microphone in front of them, right? right, right. Um, and I, in my early years, kind of downplayed that part mm. of it. I said, well, you know, I'm not a great public speaker and nobody really cares what the president <laughs> of Casey thinks anyway. And, you know, it's better the grantees should be speaking mm. and some of our internal subject matter experts. And um, so I was a little bit... Um, uh, Shy is the wrong word, but reluctant to, to step up to the public-facing part of the role. Mm. Um, and it was only in the last few years that I th- sort of realized um, that, oh, like you don't have to be a great speaker. Mm-hmm. They still care what, what you have to say. say. <laughs> <Right>. <laughs> and there are things you can say that um, lots of folks would love to be able to Same. say, and you need to speak up for their point of view. It's not just you. It's mm-hmm. really not just what you think, but it's... Um, ideas or perspectives that are not often brought to the table. Right. And that is a huge privilege, mm. but it's also a huge responsibility to mm. uh, to step up to that. As I say, you're already doing that, <laughs> so this isn't new news for you, but it took me a while to settle into that part of the role. For this awesome advice to remember. <laughs> so I heard uh, be myself, I heard build others, and be bold and use my voice. Exactly. That's good advice yeah. that I will absolutely take to heart. <laughs> Um, so as we close out this uh, this interview, you have spent so much of your life uh, devoted to helping children and families succeed. And I wonder um, what you think it's going to take to make kids count in this country. Hmm. Yeah, well, that's a, um, a really tough, tough question. Um, so I guess I start with the importance of listening to the young people themselves Mm -hmm. uh, because we often assume we know what young people need or how they see the world. And sometimes, you know, we are more experienced and um, it certainly is the case that we often uh, have a broader view uh, and perhaps a more informed view of what the possibilities are. But having said that, if we don't really listen to young people, we'll be solving the wrong problems. Right, right. <laughs> and we'll be missing the opportunity for them to develop and for them to, you know, even if they're, and I put it in quotes, wrong, you know, wrong in the sense that uh, they may not have all the information mm-hmm. and so they're reaching a conclusion that really isn't as informed mm-hmm. as it ought to be. Nevertheless, they'll figure that out right. if we give them the opportunity right. uh, instead of shutting them aside. So that's one of the things. If we're going to make kids count, we have to make kids heard. Mm. So that's a critical uh, piece of that. I think the foundations work, and hopefully more foundations will do this as well, um, the work on civic engagement, Mm. that is recognizing who are the folks in the country who are the combination of most at risk of being cut off from opportunity and least likely to have their voices heard. How do we increase their civic engagement um, at every level? Mm -hmm. So whether that's participating in uh, community activities, Mm -hmm. but also in um, voting. Political life. Yeah, in political Mm -hmm. life. Um, Again, at at every level, Mm -hmm. Um, at the community level, at the city level, at the state level, federal level. Um, And I think that's an important part of making uh, kids count. As the, as the boomers retire, my generation mm-hmm. retires, and as we look at the workforce and the demands ahead, the hope is that we will again get to where this country has been sometimes in the past when we recognize, oh, we are not investing enough in children, mm-hmm. you know, when we said we do have to educate all kids. And then we should have uh, uh, mandatory education through 16 at the time. Right. Uh, maybe we'll get back to that place again. Good. Well, I I think that's wonderful advice. We need to listen and we need to empower families and young people to lead. And um, we have to ensure everybody's at the table as we make decisions. And I think you're a leader who has worked so hard to make all three of those things happen throughout uh, your career. And so on behalf of so many folks, those who've had the joy of working with you and just those who have benefited from your hard work and efforts and leadership. Thank you for everything you have done at the Annie E. Casey Foundation and in your other roles uh, in the 
nonprofit and public sectors. Thank you for that. And thank you for all that you leave me at the at the foundation. I'm looking so forward to uh, the new horizons ahead of me, but know that I have the pleasure of the wisdom and friendship of folks like you beside me. Thanks. Oh, well, thank you, Lisa. And I can't wait to see what you're going to do. <laughs> well, thank you. Well, thank you so much for joining me today on Casey Cast, Patrick. And thank you for all you've done to strengthen the foundation and its impact over these last 25 years. Um, the difference that you have made in this role is inspiring, undeniable, and to so many children and parents across the nation, life-changing. So I wish you the very best in your retirement. You have earned it. <laughs> I also want to thank you, our listeners, for joining us today. If you've enjoyed today's conversation, please rate our show on Apple Podcasts to help others find us. You can ask questions and leave us feedback on Twitter by using the CaseyCast hashtag. To learn more about Casey and the work of our guests, you can find our show notes at aecf.org forward slash podcast. Until next time, I wish all of America's kids and all of you a bright future.